No one. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of What's Tom Reading? I'm Tom and today I'm talking about the historical fiction novel Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. This book focuses on the brave 300 Spartans who held off hordes of Persian invaders in a heroic last stand at the hot gates. You don't want to miss this one, guys. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. All right. So as I said, today I am talking about Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. And this is a historical fiction novel, which obviously it is, right? Because we don't have any contemporaneous accounts of the events that did or did not happen at the hot gates in Thermopylae um, with the 300 Spartans and fighting Xerxes army. Um, Historians are sort of divided on this. Some, uh, I think, probably think that this never happened at all. Some think that it did happen, but not in the way that... uh, um, you know, popular uh, myth would have you believe. I tend to lean towards like, yeah, let's just let's all pretend like it for sure did happen the way that uh, the way that we think it did, because why not? Right. Like the it, it happened so long ago that the moral of the story, I think, matters more specifically than like the numbers or the dates or, you know, any of the any of the minutia that you might expect from like a, a perfectly accurate historical account. I think this makes such a great story that it's worth telling and it's true, even if it's not true, right? Like, you know, you've, you've heard that kind of, you've probably heard that kind of cliched phrase, right? That all stories are true um, because they're told by humans and you know, they, it all comes from our collective experience and yada, yada, yada. But um, the reason there's sort of some scrutiny on whether or not this happened and definitely whether or not it happened in the way that um, we think it might've happened. The, the legend says it happened is that it was, uh, it's brought to us by a, uh, a historian named Herodotus who is kind of, um, some people sort of joke that he's like the greatest liar in in like all of history. Um, I, I I tend to be on team like, you know, Herodotus was in it to tell good stories. And uh, this is a great story. It's an awesome story. Um, if you don't know that much about the Spartan 300 in the story, don't worry about that. I will explain all of it. Uh, if you do know a, a lot about that, and I'm, I'm sure you probably know more than me about that, um, if you're if you're into that sort of thing. But if you're like a historical buff, then please, 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 like just bear with me on this. Um, I'm going to I'm going to give like the thousand mile up approach to this and kind of focus more on the story Um as it's told by the author here from this historical fiction perspective. So this this book, Gates of Fire, it was written in 1998 and it takes place in the world of the myth, the legend of the Spartan 300 who fought at the hot gates. They held off the the hordes and hordes of Persians um, under under King Xerxes. And um, one of the. One of the really cool things about this book that I that I love just right out of the gate. And please remember, this is this is a podcast about reviewing books, not about me pretending that I'm some sort of a historian because I'm not. I promise uh, I'm going to get some things wrong on this. But this book um, follows a character, uh, Zeonese. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Um, X-E-O-N-E-S. If any of you are fluent ancient Greek speakers or pretend ancient Greek speakers, as the case may be, uh, I'm going to go with Zionese on this, though. Um, but it follows this 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 fictional character who was at the hot gates with Leonidas and the 300 Spartans fighting in this heroic suicide mission last stand thing. Um, to save all of Greece. And it, it talks about his, his this, the whole thing comes from his perspective. He's sort of like an, an accidental survivor. We'll get to that. First, let's talk a little bit about the author. And this, this is actually one of the more, most, um, fun experiences I've had when researching an author. Um, because usually they have a pretty, um, standard, uh, pedigree like they a lot of a lot of authors they're like yes i wanted to be an author and then i became an author and now i'm an author um this guy stephen pressfield though um 
I found his website. It's stephenpressfield.com if you want to go check it out. It's really cool. Um, but it, the top of it says, I wrote for 17 years before I earned my first penny, which was a $3,500 option on a screenplay that was never produced. And then uh, he says that he wrote for 27 years before he got his first novel published and that he drove tractor trailers, uh, semi trucks, uh, worked in advertising, worked on an oil rig, um, picked fruit. This guy uh, <laughs> has kind of a this really cool blue collar background and i i don't want to be super presumptuous here but um not knowing that until after i finished the book uh, and was doing research for the show um and then like looking back at the book as, as i was reading it i'm like yeah actually some of that some of that blue collar grit does come through in the writing there's was, there was some of it that was um um so by way of just a, just a, just a really short digression here, some authors, you can tell when they write a fight scene or they write a scene about someone like working hard, plowing a field or something like that, um, you can tell uh, if you have done blue collar work, um, which I have been fortunate enough to do, I guess, um, <laughs> if you can call that fortunate. Um, some authors you can tell that they haven't done that type of work before, right? Like they, the, the way that they des describe the work and the character's response to the work, it seems really inorganic. But there are different times throughout this book where Pressfield is describing uh, Zionese's experience it, and it, it's it's like dead on. I'm like, oh, I have I have done that type of work before and I have felt that type of like uh, pain like the day after, right? Like, like the description is very, very, very accurate. You know, um, I, I had a job where I, I was swinging sledgehammers all day to like bust up concrete, right? For a contractor that that job sucked. And um, the description that Pressfield goes into of like the fatigue, the muscle fatigue, especially the next day and the stiffness and the soreness and like the rolling your shoulders and stuff like that. That's something that I feel like a lot of people could kind of intuit, um, but that he just nails. And I think that comes from that blue collar background, which I think is super, super cool. And it actually adds a lot of interesting flavor to um, his writing. And I'm going to get right. I'm going to get back to the book, but I also wanted to read like a couple. He has, he's a, he has a couple of mantras here for young writers on his, um, on his website here. And just so you know how this hit me, um, yesterday, as of this recording, I just got a rejection letter on a manuscript that I sent into a publisher. Um, they told me that it was, that it was like the editors were looking at it and, oh, this is going to be, you know, I, I waited, I waited a long, long time for a response. And then yesterday I got this really clipped email that said, it's not what we're looking for right now. We're going to pass. And so I remain myself, uh, an aspiring, but not uh, successful and not even good author. Um, but to see that this guy, he wrote for 27 years without publishing a book. Like, OK, I don't I don't have it that bad. Right. Um, and so his first mantra, um, he says that talent is bullcrap. And uh, I say bullcrap because this is a family program. Um, but yeah, he says talent is bull uh, excrement <laughs> and it, he, he uh, extrapolates on that by saying, I've seen a million writers with talent. It means nothing. You need guts. You need stick to itiveness. It's work. You got to work. Do the freaking work. That's why you're going to make it, son. You work. No one can take that away from you. And the second mantra is the work is everything. And he says, I'll tell you something else. Appreciate these days. These days when you're broke and struggling, they're the best days of your life. You're going to break through, my boy. And when you do, you'll look back on this time and think that this is when I was really an artist when everything was pure and I had nothing but the dream and the work. Enjoy it now. Pay attention. These are the good days. Be grateful for them. Um, that that warmed my heart in my in my state of abject failure um, that that, you know, maybe someday I'll finally get something published. I'll finally write something that somebody wants to read. As of now, I'll just stick to um, plan A, which is. Um, go to uh, too much college, uh, acquire too much student debt, and then um, wear a suit and tie to work. That's plan A. Plan B, though, is to be uh, writing books. Um, maybe that's maybe that's a little bit too much personal information. Maybe you know a little bit too much about me now. I certainly feel exposed uh, because you know I haven't published anything yet. And if you're out there in that position, um, take comfort from the author from Pressfield, who wrote this awesome book and a bunch of other really awesome books, but it took him 27 years to be able to do it. I, my favorite author is uh, Brandon Sanderson. He's a fantasy fiction author and he 
um, he I, I heard on a podcast of his or, or something like that, some some podcast or presser he was doing uh, where he wrote essentially 13 full length novels that were all rejected before he before his career took off. And I'm like, oh, man. And he says the same thing, right? Like talent's great, but it's about grit. It's about work. It's about determination um, and hustle. And, and he's now I think one of the most successful. I, well, I I know he's one of the most successful fantasy fiction writers ever. I think he's also like top three best fantasy fiction writers of all time. So uh, let that encourage you, whatever it is that you're working on right now. If it's not breaking loose, um, just give it another 27 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. Anyways, I'm going to get back to the story now. That's that's more than enough about me. Um, so this story, Gates of Fire, as I said, takes place um, uh, uh, in the ancient Greek world. Where. Greece has been invaded by Persia and to kind of put a little bit of just just the teeniest bit of perspective on this Xerxes, who's the the emperor of Persia, he's invading uh, the Greeks sort of as a revenge, right? Because his father, uh, I want to say Darius, um, Darius the Great, maybe um, that sounds right to me. Um, his father, like I'm going off script right now, right? Like this is, this is, uh, this was not contained in the book. I'm just doing a little bit of foreshadowing for setting up the events of the book, but his father invaded Greece at one point, And then, um, the Greeks defeated the Persians at the battle of marathon, which is where we get, you know, running a marathon from that 26 point, whatever miles. Um, and you know, the guy who the soldier after the victory runs back to, um, I think marathon, <laughs> the 26 ish miles and um, says Nike, a.k.a. Victory falls down, dies um, because he's poorly conditioned and he can only run 26 miles, even though like I know like half the people I know run marathons, which is weird. Actually, now that I think about it, because I'm never going to run a marathon. Um, but I guess this uh, battle hardened soldier, maybe he was tired from the day's fighting. Anyways, he collapses, dies. That's the Battle of the Marathon. Xerx, uh, Dar Darius is sent home to Persia, back to his empire, um, disgraced and defeated. And Xerxes, his son, is coming back for round two. This time, the Greeks are going down. He brings an army of, of Medeans and, and, you know, people from all over the emperor or the empire, this vast, vast empire, this huge collection of different warriors. There's cavalry, there's uh, archers, there's... Um, you know, skirmishers with with light wicker shields and things like that. And he's bringing them to Greece. He's going to invade. It's over. Game over. Greece submit to me, become my empire or else, basically. And um, <clears throat> the Greeks are divided, as always in this time period, over what their response should be. And um, the Spartan king, one of two Spartan kings whose name is Leonidas or Le Leonidas, depending on your preferred pronunciation. I like Leonidas, um, so I'm going to stick with that. Uh, I am aware that it's probably Leonidas, but that. Uh, eh, eh, eh. So anyways, Leonidas, um, he wants to go and fight the Persians and stop them. But then there's all sorts of different political intrigue and oracles and blah, 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 blah. blah right. That's not important to the story. But basically, he ends up being restricted. He has to take his personal guard with him. And his personal guard is limited to um, 300 picked men. And he goes and he picks 300 men. And the reason he picks them um, is sort of lost to time. Presumably, they were the best. Uh, as legend has it, they were all sires, which means they all had sons um, to take on the family name because everybody knew that, you know, this is a sires only army. This is a suicide mission. Nobody's coming home from this. 300 guys are going to go and fight, you know, the unstoppable army of Xerxes to try and inspire Greece to get off of its butt and put up a defense. Right. Um, that's kind of the idea. And, and Leonidas feels like Sparta's honor is on the line. And so he picks these 300 men in the book, though. What's really cool. Um, actually, I'll get to that. But the author has a really cool reason why Leonidas picked them. And I think it was really, really inspiring, actually. So anyways, he picks these 300. They go off to a place that's called the Hot Gates. Um, it's the, the pass at Thermopylae. And essentially, if you can imagine this in, in your mind's eye, basically, there's the ocean and then a 
cliff and then a little pass and then another cliff on on the other side. Right. And in order for you to to get through this area, you have to go through the pass and the pass is pretty narrow and it gets narrow, particularly at a spot where the Spartans are like, that's the hot gates. That's where we're going to fight, um, because then we can negate Xerxes numerical advantage. Right. He'll only, he'll only be able to fight us, you know, along our battle line, which is as long as we say it is. Um, it's as it's as long as the space available on this pass. And then there's a cliff on one side that goes down to the ocean and a cliff on the other side that goes way, way up to uh, some mountains or something. I don't know. It's, it would be super hard for um, Xerxes army to use anything other than this pass. And so they know that if they're going to slow down Xerxes, if they're going to fight him, then this is the spot. So they march out there with their 300 Spartans. They pick up a, a, a number of different Greek allies, possibly um, between four and 6,000 of them, depending on what you think. The Spartans also have, you know, their own slaves and servants. Um, helots is what their slaves are called, <clears throat> who uh, attend to them um, in the battle. Some of them even fight, um, you know, as as archers and different things like that and, you know, carry spare spears. And that's that's kind of the situation that the the that this book focuses on. So that's the background. They're there. They're trying to stop this huge army. Um, and like I said, that's the, that's like the 10,000 miles up super duper compressed spark notes version of what's going on here. Just to bring anyone up to speed. If you haven't heard about it, if you have heard about it, I probably butchered it. I'm sorry. But anyways, we jump into the story <clears throat> and we're talking. Um, the story starts actually with Zionese. Um, after the Battle of Thermopylae, after all of the Spartans have been killed, after Leonidas has been beheaded. Yeah, spoiler alert, they all die, right? That's that's kind of the thing, the, the Spartan heroic last stand, right? <clears throat> and so the story starts with Zeonis, this fictional character. They, the, the surgeons, uh, Xerxes' surgeons, as they're combing over the battle dead, they find Zeonis and he's still technically barely alive. And they work super hard to revive him. They bring him back to consciousness. He's still wounded and doing pretty badly, but he's able to kind of speak again. And they say, okay, what the crap just happened? What just happened just now with 300 dudes donkey kicking Xerxes army and killing thousands and thousands of people. What just happened? Who are these guys? Tell us everything about these men and their culture and what goes into making warriors like that. Because we know now that we've killed one of their kings, that we've kind of kicked the hornet's nest in Sparta, and we're going to have to fight thousands and thousands of these dudes. And Zeonese, um, you know, he's he's actually... Um, really disappointed. So he's actually, um, he's not a Spartan himself. He's a helot. He was captured from a nearby village. He becomes a helot, but then a really well-respected member of the household of uh, Dionikes, who is a, uh, uh, who is a full citizen Spartan. Um, and so he ends up going with Dionikes to this battle site and carrying spears for him and spares. And he has, he's an archer. He does different things and he decides that he wants to stay for this last stand, right? Towards the end of the battle, Leonidas sends all of the Greek allies away so they can survive and tell the story and spread the legend and tell Herodotus. Or, I mean, obviously Herodotus wasn't around, but that's supposedly where the first hand accounts come from is these surviving Greeks who were sent away by Leonidas, who says, nope, we Spartans are going to stay here. This is it. We're done. It's over. Today's the day. Tonight we dine in hell. Right. And, you know, the, the whole kind of uh, Spartan warrior ethos and Zionese decides you know what these are my people I'm staying with them I'm staying with Dionikes that my honor compels it and so he's actually when the surgeons um when the Persian surgeons Persian surgeons Persian surgeons say that a couple of times um, when the Persian surgeons <laughs> um revive Zionese he's actually pretty bummed that he's alive. He's like, he's like, um, man, I really wish that I died and I was with my buddies now in the afterlife or whatever. Instead, I got to be around a bunch of stinky Persians who, uh, you know, we just were slaughtering for, you know, a couple of days here. Uh, the enemy, right? He's, he's not happy, but he feels like the gods have sent him back to tell the Spartan story. And so that's that's the the mechanism that the author Pressfield uses to be able to give us this first hand account of the, the battle of Thermopylae from the Spartan perspective, even though none of them survived. It's kind of a clever way to do it. I actually really appreciated that about this book. Really liked that about this book, actually. Um, and so Zionese talks about, you know, the Spartans, they trained from from boyhood to be warriors. It's their whole culture. <clears throat> they fight in what's called a phalanx. 
which is like shoulder to shoulder, really tight ranks with these big round brass shields with like the, so they're brass on the outside or, or sorry, bronze, excuse me. They're bronze on the outside with uh, with like oak inlays. Um, they have eight foot spears with a, with a, they've got a bronze butt spike on, on the, uh, on the side that you hold. And then on the far side, there's an iron tip, right? And so the butt spike, they call it the lizard sticker. You use it to, um, well, to dispatch enemies that are on the ground, basically, is what it's for. Um, or to, like, fix the spear into the ground to absorb a charge. Different things, but basically, um, that's that's kind of their kit. They wear um, thigh-length greaves, which are, you know, thigh and shin armor that are made out of bronze and leather. Um, they wear, like, these leather skirts. They have these bronze breastplates. They have, hor- like, big, big um, helmets that are, that are really cool because um, they, they sort of... Uh, uh, it's hard to describe in, through this medium, but basically if you want to look up um, Spartan helmet and you'll see it, it's basically like a, like a pointy bucket shaped thing <laughs> that goes over their head. And then there's a, there's a notch that goes down over the nose um, between the eyes as well. And so the, the basically when someone puts on the helmet, their eyes are kind of deep recessed inside the helmet. So the, there's this, this sort of blackness there and it transforms them from being like really mild looking, nice Spartan, Spartan men who are well groomed and well kept, and then they put those helmets on, and then they're animals, like mechanized monsters. Basically, you can't see their eyes anymore. They're all kitted out in bronze armor. They they polish their shields to be like such a sheen that they can like try and blind their enemies with them. Really, really gets into their enemies' heads, right? Um, and these Spartans, they follow this rigorous, rigorous um, code. This this rigorous code of ethics that that is all about war. You know, they they clean their equipment a certain way every night after battle. They brush their hair, they wash like they have this this rigorous code that they adhere to. And then when they fight, they fight in lockstep in uniform in uniformity and in like total synchronization. They're basically trying to turn, you know, a group of men into one big machine of muscle and metal and sinew and like iron and spears and it's really cool the this this phalanx is one of the most fierce um mechanisms of war and it lasts for i mean like thousands of years basically it's the best way to fight for a long 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 time basically until guns were invented um maybe i mean maybe a little earlier than that the romans had some success against phalanxes um but basically i i mean this phalanx is unstoppable and the Persians are bringing lightweight troops with like wicker shields and shorter javelin style spears. And they throw these Persians at the Spartan line and the Spartans just butcher them. They're like the wicker shields are no match for the spears. They're no match for like the, the synchronized, like pushing forward in lockstep. And, and the cool thing is with the, with the Spartan way of doing it is you've got your front rankers, they hold their shield up and they put their spears kind of overhand above their shields. And they use that to kind of stab at the faces and necks of their enemies. They keep the shield there and the shield in their left hand covers the guy to their left and the guy on their right brings his shield over and it covers them. And so, so they're all super well covered and there's just spears jabbing in from over top of the shield, the shield wall. And then when the shield wall makes contact with the enemy, um, the Spartans who are behind the, the, a couple of ranks back, the second and third rank, they can reach with their spears and poke it at, at the enemy as they want to as well. Um, but mostly they all they just push and they all push together at the same time as one. And they're able to just like they're able to just bowl over their enemies and literally trample them. And the front ranks just keep on pushing forward and knocking people off their feet and trampling them while the back row, the back ranks just follow behind. And like the sixth or seventh rank of Spartans, basically their job is. And a lot of times this is kind of the job of the helots as well. Um, their job is just to follow the Spartans and like stab and cut the throats of the men who were trampled and left behind right like this is a grisly grisly machine of war that's literally designed to just like crush and pulverize 
their enemies. And when they're fighting, you know, phalanx against phalanx, a lot of times it, it turns into this grinding, pushing, uh, whatever the opposite of a tug of war is, right? Where they're just back and forth and back and forth. And then the first side to break gets massacred in the back as they run away, right? That's how the Greeks are used to fighting. But when Leonidas and his men end up fighting the Persians, they're, they are heavy infantry. And I mean, really heavy in- infantry. And they're lockstep and they're disciplined and they're tough and they're mean. Uh, and they are really, really good at killing. And they go up against light in- infantry, even skirmishing infantry, even archers um, who are they're wearing you know cloth armor and they have wicker shields and they have short swords and short spears. And they're they don't fight in battle order. They just kind of like run up and and, um, you know, try to to. to break into this phalanx formation and they're profoundly unsuccessful as the story goes in the first um, parts of fighting Xerxes is uh, watching from on high. He kind of gets a position up somewhere, um, you know, a little ways up the cliff face. They ha- he has a platform built so that he can watch the fighting. And he's just like, he's just stunned when he sees he, he commits thousands and thousands of troops to try and knock these 300 Spartans out of the way. And his people, his people just get massacred. They are just, they're slaughtered by the Spartans who are, they're just unstoppable. And basically in the first day of fighting, the Spartans have their way so badly that they only stop because they are f- too physically exhausted from slaughtering, right? Like, like they're not wounded. They're not dying themselves. There's not that they had any casualties. They're just so physically tired from the mechanical work of slaughtering that they have to take a break. And so they, they retreat back and allow some of their Greek allies to kind of pour in and the like Thracians and things like that. Um, they, they kind of jump in and, and take their turn, you know, beating up the Persians as well. Um, they're not as good, but they're great. Right. And that's, uh, that's one of the lines that Le- Leonidas has in the book where he says, you know, we Spartans, uh, we train from boyhood to, um, to be warriors. And, uh, you know, these other Greeks come they're they're farmers and potters and, and, you know, craftsmen for their job but they come here and they have the same thing that makes us great they have courage and they're fighting for their families and their loved ones back home and they're fighting for greece and the idea of greece um and so leonidas in the book at least he has this profound respect for the greeks who have chosen to join him on this suicide mission this last stand because he says hey we do not have a monopoly on courage as spartans we might have we might be the most skilled we might be the best fighters but you know you guys you guys really bring it too so um you know kudos to you guys and it, it the book is very um flattering especially compared to the movie oh i forgot to mention there's a movie about this it's got gerard butler in it as leonidas it's uh it's awesome you should watch it if you want to um it's basically like a bunch of like cgi dudes with painted on abs um doing i i think i think if there was no slow motion the entire runtime would be like 27 minutes <laughs> there's like a, there's a lot of slow motion in this um but the a lot of the visuals that i got while i was reading i kind of borrowed from the movie so um that's something if you if you've ever seen the movie then it ports over really well to reading the book basically um what what point was I making before I did that? I kind of lost my train of thought. Uh, there's a movie though. Oh yes. The movie, um, the movie portrays the 300 Spartans is just be, it's just them. It's just them and only them. But in the book, it really gives a lot of credit to the Greek allies who allow the Spartans to rest and, and to recuperate after a very, very hard day of fighting. And they kind of take over their turn and they, they fight really well as well. I mean, they're not as good as the Spartans and a lot of them die. Um, and the Persians are able to, you know, put up a much better fight with them, but the Spartans are able to rotate out and get some rest, which is far, far, far more realistic. And so this, uh, this battle rages back and forth for a few days. The, the, the Greeks are taking more and more casualties and the Spartans start to take some casualties as well as Xerxes, um, commits better and better troops. And so one, one of the things that he does is he commits, um, they're called the immortals, right? They're these, uh, uh, his personal guard. And they're made up of like the, the, the favorite sons of Persia. A lot of them are Xerxes, like literal sons from like his harem, <laughs> like, um, his literal sons who are kind of being groomed. And the, the reason they're called the immortals is because there's 10,000 of them. And if one of them dies, they're immediately replaced. There's always 10,000 immortals. So it's like, they didn't die. Um, that's kind of how it goes, but they're like, 
Leonidas has a really cool battle plan and it's a battle plan that I've heard um, contemporary friends of mine who are in the military now describe as as one that one one that uh, the United States uh, intends to potentially deploy against China if ever if ever we enter into a real um, conflict with them. But the battle plan is like, look, Xerxes is sending his best troops, but they're also his sons. So all we got to do is start massacring them, right? They're his best troops, but if we start absolutely rolling them and making them, you know, suffer and killing them and and causing problems with them, then Xerxes is going to lose the stomach for this fight long before we do. And that's kind of that's kind of a cool strategy. And I've heard similar things as far as like uh, modern strategy, right? Because um, a lot of times it's it's high ranking party members in China who they send their their sons, a lot of times their only son, right, into the military, and they get these high ranking prestigious positions a lot of those positions now are like um captains of small ships or um fighter pilots right like they want to be able to do something cool and prestigious to help out their career uh, which is great in times of peace but in times of war then you've got like the, these sons of high-ranking ministers in very very vulnerable positions in in priority target assets right and so um the kind of going theory is that like yeah you know if there was a shooting war that that it, kicked off between the United States and China, um, you know, the Chinese ministers, high ranking officials in the party would lose stomach for it because they'd start to lose their sons. Um, and, and that's Leonidas' strategy with the immortals. It's a really cool thing that the author tosses in there um, as, as a piece of strategy. And there's lots of that. There's lots of cool um, military strategy. It's not just ground and pound, although uh, one of my favorite strategies uh, or sorry, one of my favorite quotes from this comes from Leonidas. He's talking about, um, someone comes and tells him, oh, Xerxes, he's a, he's a talented commander and his troops can do this and they can do that and they can, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the famous thing, right? Like, the, the, you know, when the when the archers shoot the arrows, they're, they're so numerous that they block out the sun and well, then we should fight in the shade, right? Like, <laughs> like a really cool, um, cool kind of attitude to it. But one of the things that I really loved, my favorite quote, and I had never heard it before, um, it was... Uh, in reference to Xerxes excellent ger- like generalship and he has good generals underneath him and they have all these strategies and they, they've done all these things and conquered in all these different ways and Leonidas says yes the fox knows many tricks the hedgehog on the other hand knows only one but it is a good one and he's referring there to the phalanx right like they, they only know one trick and that is Point yourself in the direction of the enemy, get in real close with your buds and grind forward and don't stop until everybody is dead. That is the strategy. That's it. Right. And, you know, they, they position themselves in the hot gates in order to maximize the viability of that strategy, of course. Right. But at the end of the day, the Spartans really they don't they don't go for like cunning. They don't go for like strategy and flanking. They say, no, we're pointing ourselves at you and we're going to come kill you, all of you. Right. And we're going to kill you until we're too tired, tired to kill you anymore. And then we're going to sleep and then we're going to wake up in the morning. And we're going to kill you again. That's the part. That's the that is the uh, the strategy for Leonidas and the Spartans. And it, it's amazing. And it was the visuals of this book, um, I want you to go get it. And if you want to go get it, then, you know, the link in this, the link in the description of this episode will have um, an Amazon. It'll take you to the Amazon page where you can pick up the book. If you do that, then you'll help out the podcast. I'll get like an Amazon affiliate uh, fee there. Gives me a few pennies. It doesn't cost you anything extra. It's a good way for you to be able to support the show. I would really appreciate it. Um, But yeah, if you want to pick up this book, I, I haven't done it justice i don't feel like right because it's so hard for me in the short time that i have to be able to describe to you the visuals of this but it's gritty and it's nasty and the like the it's gory and gruesome but it's also glorious right and for me this was this was like the perfect book because it just really brings the heat and it brings the emotion and you really you really feel for zeanese and his his torn honor and he, he wants to be back with the love of his life and it's it's love lost and it's you know he lost his home and there's this this tragic beautiful wonderful experience and i told you i'd get back to it so i'm getting back to it right now before we go over to the corners but the reason that leonidas picked the men and he explains this to one spartan woman before they march off to war and this woman her husband was picked and her son was picked and she has to bear this horrendous burden of of saying goodbye 
to her husband and son who she knows she's never going to see again. She knows it's a suicide mission and everybody knows it's a suicide mission. Um, her son has a, a baby boy, right? So he's technically a sire. He can technically go on the mission. And she says, uh, Leonidas goes to speak with her and he says, I suppose you hate me. And she says, well, uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> right. Like, like why, why did you do this to me? Um, there were, you know, the, because the thing is, is there, there was no shortage of men who wanted to go, right. Um, they were limited to 300 for his personal guard or whatever, but there were a lot of men who were sitting there like really, really annoyed that they didn't get to go. And there was a lot of rumors about why he chose the ones that he chose, especially since, you know, this, this son of this woman, uh, Alexandros is his name. He has a baby boy and he's, he's a young, young, young man. Um, and so Leonidas says, well, they all have their suspicions about why I picked the men that I picked, but the truth is, I picked them for their women. I picked them because I knew that their women could bear the burden of having the men go off and die. And I knew that they could bear it like Spartans. And I knew that when we were gone and did our small part, our little piece of the puzzle here to help inspire Greece to war, that the real inspiration would come from the stiff upper lip of the Spartan women who sacrificed their husbands and their sons on the altar of Greek freedom and didn't shed a tear and didn't break down and kept their courage and kept their strength and kept up the will to fight. That's why I picked the men was for their women. And that was, that was such a cool scene. That was awesome. I loved that. It was great. Uh, the Spartans all die in the end, <laughs> but, but it was, it was a beautiful, beautiful, poetic, wonderful telling of this classic, awesome story. I loved it. You would love it too. You should get the book. Let's break for the corners right now, okay? Let's head on over first to the science corner. All right, so welcome to the science corner. Today I'm talking about bronze. Bronze is a metal alloy that is so awesome and cool. And I mean, it, it's on topic for today, right? Because the Spartans, their armor was made of bronze, their shields were made of bronze. This, this prolific metal, um, inspired what's known as the bronze age, right? It was, it was in widespread use. It was the hardest metal during this archeological period. And it's made, um, it's made, uh, it's an alloy of copper and tin, and it's about 90% copper, 10% tin, somewhere around there. And people were using copper before the invention of bronze, um, but copper is is pretty, uh, pretty soft as a metal, right? Like pretty moldable, pretty bendable, not the best armor, not a terrible armor, right? Obviously better than your bare skin, but bronze, it's like a much harder, much stronger much more durable metal. And the way they think that it was made is potentially from like a campfire where like some rocks that contained uh, copper ore and some rocks that contained tin ore were used to line a campfire and the campfire got super, super hot and the metals melted out and mixed. And then what, what resulted was a really, really tough, uh, never before seen alloy. Um, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Um, the, the, there's kind of a habit in, in science to say, well, what, what an amazing, crazy accident that this happened. Um, I, I tend to be more of the opinion that probably somebody really smart came up with bronze. They're like, oh, here's tin, here's copper. What happens if we mix some of it? Oh, it makes a different metal, right? I don't know. Personally, that's what I want to believe. Um, but, you know, maybe I'm just too optimistic like that. I, I tend to, well... You know what I tend to do, you guys. I tend to think that human ingenuity is awesome and that uh, there's no such thing as accidents when it comes to things like that. But this was a science corner. That's bronze. Bronze was used to make armor, armor and uh, weapons and shields and spears and axe heads and all kinds of really cool things all throughout the Bronze Age. Uh, and then the Bronze Age is overtaken uh, eventually by the Iron Age when they start to use iron instead. So this was the science corner. Let's head over to the history corner. So welcome to the History Corner. We get to do something kind of interesting today because we've been talking about ancient, ancient history, right? With the Spartans at the at the Battle of Thermopylae. We actually get to move 
forward in time for our history corner today to Sparta later on, right? And um, Sparta keeps up this, uh, yeah, I mean, so long story short, Xerxes is is driven back, right? Um, the Greeks are free, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Um, and Sparta kind of has this reputation as being, you know, one of the greatest states, city states in Greece. Right. And they, they keep up this reputation through force of arms and they keep up their military kind of ethos and all that stuff for a long, long time. They have a good old run as, as Sparta. Um, but over time they start to become less and less relevant. Um, the, the Macedonians take over the area and they don't even bother with Sparta, right? They're just like, eh, it's, I mean, goats don't even want to live there, right? So they just leave Sparta alone. They kind of waste away into insignificance until the Romans really kind of start to rise up on the scene. And they are just, they are bonkers about Sparta and all the cool stories about Sparta, especially. I mean, they were, here's something cool about history, right? Is that the Romans looked back and were like, wow, how cool was the Battle of Thermopylae with Leonidas, right? 2,000 years ago, the Romans were stoked on Leonidas, who was, you know, a long time before that, right? Um, so history is very, very cool that way. Anyways, the Romans, they're mad about the Spartans. They, they, they love them. They're, they're, they, so they go to Sparta on, like, pilgrimages to see Sparta. And at this point, Sparta is, like, wasted away into, like, a, like a, a hollow shell of itself. But... The Romans come and this cottage tourism industry starts to pop up. And these Spartans um, are now incentivized to imitate the old Spartan ways, uh, you know, the warrior culture that they once had so that they can put on a good show for the Roman visitors. And they, they end up putting on like this pantomime of their ancestors, uh, you know, the way their ancestors lived, even though they don't live that way anymore. Right. Um, in order to keep like Roman tourists happy. And it becomes like this, this almost like Las Vegas sort of like attraction where like, you know, the, there's a lot of food vendors. And when the tourism season is on, you know, the, the, the locals get rich and, and make different foods for them and put on like little shows in the, in like this, the village square of young boys beating the crap out of each other and getting whipped or whatever, you know, in that old Spartan toughness way. Right. Like yeah, it's, it's basically baloney, but the Romans, they freaking loved it. Right. So I guess what I'm saying is, Come on, Sparta. Do it again. Do more Sparta, please, Sparta. I want to go visit Sparta. I want to see Leonidas. I want to go to Sparta land and buy a buy a Sparta helmet. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, we can still commodify Sparta for sure. Let's think about that. Uh, give me a call, Sparta, when you get a chance. This has been the History Corner. Let's go over to the Random Corner. Did you know that because Sparta is so cool and cool about war and stuff that people are always using Sparta to describe their newest and coolest technologies? For example, well, their technologies of war, right? So, for example, there's an anti-ballistic mi uh, missile used by the U.S. military that's supposed to be able to shoot down intercon intercontinental ballistic missiles. Excuse me, that was so hard for me to say for some reason. Intercontinental ballistic missiles. That is something that I have read often and said very rarely. Um, wow, one of those. Anyways, this Spartan missile is supposed to go and fly up into space and intercept ICBMs and blow them up in midair. See, Spartans never die. And that's the cool thing. You know, yes, it was a suicide mission, but man, did it have some implications leading off into the future. This has been The Random Corner. Let's head back to the main review. Okay. So that was it. You heard all the things that I liked about this book. Now I got to tell you a couple of things that I didn't like so much about this book. And I got to say, not that much. You can always, I think you can notice a pattern now that I mostly like the books that I read. I don't have that much negative to say about them. Um, about this one though, it was, um, Zionese, the, the main character, the main focus of the story. I, I, I didn't care about him. I'll be honest. I'll be frank. I, I did not give a crap about that guy. Um, I guess he had a love interest story that was supposed to be compelling. Um, I, I did not find it compelling. Um, 
it was with his uh, with his cousin, actually. <laughs> um, I didn't find that super interesting or compelling. Uh, I also didn't really like feel that bad when he died in the end. Right. Cause he, he's, he kind of, uh, dies and is returned to, uh, his, his cousin who he loved. Um, his body is anyways, the Persians have this great respect for him because he told this really cool story of, of how cool Sparta is, but I did not feel anything when that happened. I, I thought that the whole story was really dope and I thought that the battle scenes were extremely cool and impressive, but like when Zionis died, I was like, yeah, I mean, okay, sure. Um, so there was that, but anyways, let's move on to the super duper patented. Oh no, wait, I'm not calling it that anymore. Um, oh, let's move on to, the rating of the bells. That's right. This is a four star or four bells book, as the case may be. Uh, I love this book. I thought it was great. It's not quite five stars. It's definitely more than three stars. That's why I feel confident in saying it's four stars. As we've discussed previously on this show, four comes after three, but before five. Um, and five is the limit of stars that I can give. I don't know. Maybe I could change that. I could have a 10 star system, 10 bell system. I can do whatever I want. I choose this, though, for bell book. It was good. It was enjoyable. It was very entertaining from start to finish. The battle scenes were intense. Um, you should pick it up. As I said, if you want to pick it up, please follow the link that's in the description. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. If you're new, welcome. If you're a longer time listener, thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate you guys and all of your suggestions and all of your encouragement. This has been, uh, this is a labor of love for me. As you guys know, I'm pretty busy. You're all busy. Um, thank you for taking time out of your day to to do this with me um i'm gonna leave you as always with a parting thought but uh if you wouldn't mind um uh, sharing the show with someone who you think would get a kick out of it or leaving a review for me on itunes or whatever platform you're using i would really appreciate it anything we can do to help kind of grow the show would be would be uh would be super awesome so let's get right to our parting thought and for this one i decided to give you guys a little twofer right and the first one is it's kind of it's kind of a little it's a little trite right um but uh but i think it's really cool and it's this spartan creed and it says quote he who sweats more in training bleeds less in war, end quote. And, you know, that just speaks to preparation, right? If you if you on the front end, you're doing what you need to do to be prepared and, and um, you know, making sure that you're, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Then when the conflict comes, when when the war comes, you'll bleed less. Right. Uh, it'll make you better prepared. It'll make you stronger. It'll make you more fit for the fight. This one, though, this one, I think, is awesome. And this comes from Simonides, who's a Greek poet who wrote the epitaph that's sitting at Thermopylae. And it says, Go tell the Spartans, stranger passing by, that here, obedient to their laws, we lie. Every one of the 300 Spartans died in the Battle of Thermopylae. And they died for a cause, and they thought that the cause was worth their lives. And when I read that, I thought, man, what would I die for? And I have an answer to that question. And I want you to ask yourself that same question. What would you die for? And I hope you have an answer for that question. And I hope you have a good answer for that question, too, because you need one. If you don't know what you would die for, then you're probably not living for the right things either. This has been The Parting Thought. Thank you guys so much. Have a good day. You deserve it. Bye.